Good morning. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 13, verses 1 to 18. It's found in the Red Pew Bible, starting on page 11. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, but the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me, between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt toward Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, Lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south, east and west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of your land, for I am giving it to you. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. This morning, second scripture reading, staying in the Old Testament, from the book of 1 Samuel, from the 16th chapter. I'll be reading the first 13 verses. And if you're using a Red Church Bible, that starts on page 276. Most of this will be familiar from last week. So if I mess up, It's not my fault. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I'll show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When they arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes. In peace, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When, Samuel, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things 
that the people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down till he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thanks, Dave. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we give you this time. Uh, may your word go forth, uh, instruct our hearts, be our teacher. During this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So folks, uh, I have this uh, t-shirt that uh, Janelle gave me. And it says, uh, Carpenter. Noun. Carpenter, just like a normal person, only way cooler. See also amazing, incredible. Now, uh, there's a little backstory to this because I helped Janelle with a chicken coop, and I had a very small part uh, with the chicken coop. And um, but anyway, uh, I love the shirt. But here's the problem: I'm not a carpenter, right? Bob Ganaway is more than a carpenter than I am, and so is Carl and Bob Campbell and anybody else in here, right? So uh, I kind of fumbled my way through things, and, you know, thank God the door turned out okay. But, um, you know, uh, it's kind of, um, and I love the shirt, by the way, it's uh, so soft. So I will be wearing it, right? But I, I mentioned that because if you did not know me, and you saw me wearing that shirt, you would think I was a carpenter, right? Fair, fair enough, right? I mean, why, why else would I be wearing the shirt? So when I wear this shirt, it's really akin to the saying, do not judge a book by its cover. Right? That's a British idiom, by the way, uh, and it means one, one shouldn't prejudge the worth or value of something by its outward appearance. In other words, I'm not a carpenter, folks. Don't ask me to come over and do stuff for you, right? <laughs> uh, years ago, uh, we were visiting my brother-in-law and sister. Uh, he came back from the Gulf War, and he was stationed at Fort Bragg. He was in the 82nd Airborne. And uh, so anyway, I bought this really cool 82nd Airborne shirt. It had the parachute and the stars and all the clusters and the glitter. It was really, really cool, you know? And so after we leave Fort Bragg, we're making our way up to Virginia, and we're walking along the trail to go to the Natural Bridge. Uh, by the way, if you go there, George Washington carved his initials in the stone. <laughs> and uh, anyway, but we're walking along the path. And Several guys came up to me and said, oh, hey, he said, we noticed the 82nd Airborne shirt. Where are you stationed? You see? They thought it was in the 82nd. Now, I don't know why they thought that, because I was like 20 pounds overweight at the time, at least, right? And I could tell that they were actually very, very um, disappointed. Uh, they were stationed in Europe. They were on furlough. They came back from the States. 
And um, anyway, um, so what they did was they judged externally based off a shirt. It's something that many of us do, don't we? Uh, we judge externally. That's what we do. Have you ever heard the expression, uh, kicking the tires? Right? Okay, let me, let me uh, uh, just kind of give you points of reference. It refers to a person kicking the tires before they buy a car, even though they haven't driven it yet. And you probably have seen something like this in the Hollywood movie or something, you know, where maybe more of a, a, a comedy. They come up and they kick the tires, and the thing looks good. Uh, okay, I'll take it. And they start peeling out the bills and they, and they buy it, right? It's an outward judgment based on superficial analysis. When we come to 1 Samuel 16, all these illustrations that I just gave put forth the principle here that we are not to make judgments based on the externals. In other words, don't get hung up with the size, the color, the tires, or a person wearing a shirt. I remember years ago when we had um, more kids in the church, uh, somebody did, um, I don't know if it was Helen or Paul Hull, but somebody did a children's, I think it was Helen, she did a children's story, and she gave the kids the opportunity to pick presents. It was around Christmas time, right? And of course, everyone went for the big stuff. And all the, you know, the little box was ignored, right? Well, there was, there was change, there was money in the little box. And it was like, oh, can I have that? They wanted to trade, right? You don't judge things externally, right? And the notion here is that one needs to go deeper. You need to go beyond the cover of the book and take a look at the content. You need to check the engine and drive the car. How does it run? Look at the character of a person. Look at the heart as best as you can. And, and here's the problem. We don't see the heart the way God does now, do we? That's a huge problem. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, reinforces this notion that the human heart is very hung up on superficials. And that's a worldly characteristic. It got Lot in huge trouble huge trouble. You know, he looks and he sees the green, and you know the rest is history, right? Genesis 14, you're reading about how the kings were at war and Abraham had to go down and rescue Lot. And then Genesis 18 and 19, you know, the cities and the valleys on fire because God judged it, right? What this scripture is teaching us is that God doesn't operate that way. He's not hung up on externals. He sees straight through and through. As the scripture says, everything is laid bare. God sees it all. He knows it all. Can't hide anything from him. God doesn't operate on superficials and neither should we. Now, if you consider Samuel, when we looked at Samuel last week, uh, you know, we, we talked about Samuel's emotions trying to align with the heart of God because he mourned for Saul. You take a look at Samuel as a prophet and a great man of God. He's really no different than any of us. Uh, you go over to James chapter 5. We're told that Elijah is a man of like passions. You know, he struggled with sin too, right? Uh, Samuel as well. And so it was really no different. And so what happens is, he sees Jesse's eldest son, and he thought, oh, he's the man. Now, Eliab, I assume, was probably pretty physically imposing. Because God says, do not look at his height. And he was pretty good looking. Don't look at his, his appearance. It's almost like going right back into the trap. Remember why the people picked Saul? Head and shoulders above everybody else. He looked the part. Saul was kingly looking. He was big. He was strong. Probably good looking. And yet, it's not there inwardly. It started out, as we said last week, pretty good. But then Saul goes off course. Remember, I, I mentioned last week, if you were with us, when you look at Saul's kingship, 
it's, the people reject God, and so Saul was an outgrowth of that, and so Saul's kingship is actually a metaphor. It's one of rejection before God. And he rejected God's word often. You know, I, I oftentimes, when I, when I think on this scripture, I, I think of Isaiah 53. You ever read Isaiah 53 and what it says about the Lord Jesus? He had no stately form or majesty that we should be drawn to him. In other words, he wasn't physically imposing. He, the muscles weren't. It wasn't all about this, uh, you know, physically looking the part. He wasn't the kingly standout, and yet he's the king of kings and the lord of lords. That's, I mean, what a contrast between the world and how God does things. And, and so uh, the lesson here is that it's not all about what we see. Uh, for example, uh, take our political elections and our politicians. This is a classic example. It's all about the optics, folks. It's all about what people want you to see. It's not about substance. It's about rhetoric. It's not about policies. It's about presentation. It's not about character. It's about a personality contest. That's what it's become. And that's why politics and our politicians are rotten to the core. It's all about the optics. It's how they want to present themselves before you. But God looks at the heart. Amen? Uh, this story is worth repeating, but you probably know this. Uh, but Richard Nixon, you know, you know that he lost the election to John Kennedy in 1960, right? It's all about the optics. Well, what they did was that was probably like the, the you know, it was a big television debate and so Richard Nixon refused the makeup. John Kennedy took the makeup. Of course, Kennedy was probably a little bit more charismatic, maybe a lot more charismatic than Nixon. Younger, better looking. Nixon comes across sweaty and swarthy, like as if he hasn't shaven in two days when the big lights go on. And so the exit polls showed that it was all about the optics. I mean, Nixon had the better policies, but it was about the optics, you see. Samuel was sent to the house of Jesse. And the account is that Jesse's sons are kind of par paraded, the oldest to the youngest. And yet, when you take a look at this here, God was teaching Samuel, and he wants to teach us today, it's about listening to his voice. It's getting away from what we see. What is he saying to our hearts? And that is the matter. That's the matter before Samuel. Looking for a person whose heart is after God. Now, uh, I want to share something with you in my study. Uh, you know the Bible's all filled with all sorts of symbolic tidbits, right? If you take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1, and I believe that there's something behind this, otherwise I wouldn't share it with you. If you take a look at 1 Samuel 10, verse 1, it says that Saul was anointed with a flask. The Hebrew word means a small earthenware jar. And further research reveals that it had a very, very narrow neck. So when it was broken, it was impossible to mend it, right? So Samuel used that to anoint Saul. This is the same exact word that was used in 2 Kings to anoint Jehu as king. Now if you know a little bit about Jehu, this guy was like a worthless king. So what we have here is this picture of this very small flask small amount of oil <laughs> to, to anoint what happened to be two worthless kings. But when you take a look at the text, what was David anointed with? A horn. The horn of oil. 
And it's symbolic of strength and honor and dominion and glory. And get this, the understanding is that the horn held way more oil than the flask. And I don't know if this is uh, true or not. Maybe God's intending this to be a point of contrast. You know, where maybe one heart is half-hearted and half-full, and the other one is, is very full. I think there's something to that. What is clear is this. In 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, after Saul sacrificed, when he was to wait for Samuel, after he sacrificed, Samuel came along and he said, after he is disobedient, you re the Lord has rejected you in your kingdom. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. So scripture implies that Saul's heart was not after God. And that's why I think the flask and the horn have something to do with it. Saul's heart was not after the heart of God. He wanted to go do his own thing. And, and so that's the contrast in 1 Kings. Who's going to be a king or a person after God's own heart? Uh, the Apostle Paul writes in Acts 13 verse 22, when he was on his first missionary journey, and, he's, and, he, and he went into Pisidian Antioch, and he, as he's recounting Israel's history, he says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. And that's how King David was known. And what's more amazing is in 1 Samuel 16, it is speculated that David was only about 10 or 15 years of age. Think about that. Where were you at in your heart at 10 or 15 years of age with God? David is a man after God's own heart between the ages of 10 and 15 years of age. That's an amazing, amazing statement. And so this is why he's a type of Christ. Now, you know, we know that David failed miserably, but he's a type of Christ because he loved God. He was a man after God's own heart. Now, let me ask you this question here. Uh, what, is, what does it mean to be found after the heart of God? Well, I think Micah 6.8 sums it up very nicely. Uh, let me quote that for you. He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. A heart for God is loving what God stands for. It's loving his truth, his goodness, his word, his mercy. It's loving God. It's going after God in his ways versus the ways of the world. That's what it is. The world has standards and God has standards. And they're worlds apart. No pun intended. I came across this article uh, written by a Michael Cola. And uh, it's GodTV.com. And I checked them out before I was going to quote them. Um, they... Uh, they preach the gospel, and they uh, promote Focus on the Family and a number of other evangelical organizations. But he lists eight things uh, that God searches for in the heart. Now, I'm going to order these a little bit differently uh, as to how he listed them, because I want to order them in terms of more of a spiritual flow or process. But he writes, so what kind of heart does God like? God likes a heart which believes him, loves him, keeps his word, trusts him, praises him, seeks him, follows him, and serves him. Now, I think that pretty much sums it up. Uh, he further writes, quote, I believe God was saying, I have found a man who cares about the things I care about, when I turn to the right, he turns to the right. And when I turn to the left, he turns with me. Uh, I think that beautifully sums it up perfectly. That's what it means to have a heart for God. What a, what a wonderful testimony God has about David. 
I looked at this and I thought, would God say this about me? Would God say this about you? Uh, last week I talked about feelings and emotions and the need to align them with the heart of God. That's at the heart of the matter. It's having a heart for God. That's the heart of the matter. What would he say in a matter? What would he do? How would he act and react? What is his will? Those are the questions we need to ask. And it's a precious, precious thing. And you know, it's, it's like finding a rare jewel today. How many people, you go, go outside these walls, how many people do you find that has a heart for God? It's a rare jewel, folks. Very rare. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I've shared this before. I'm going to share it again because it fits with the message. You know, when I worked with the post office, and I think I've told you about this a couple times already, but it's worth repeating. We were shown a video, and they put pictures up of people. And this lady that looked like a business lady, professional, was a nightclub stripper. She had the, you know, the business suit going on, but she was the nightclub stripper. And then you had this guy in a suit. He looked real gregarious. You know, nice smile, impeccable suit. He was a con artist. And then they had this guy who had the ponytail, the tattoos, the earrings, you know, all that going on. The sleeveless shirt. And he had a master's degree and was a musician and never was in prison in his life. You know, you take, you know, we make judgments, don't we, right? That's what we do. Very, very misleading. You know, and I, I, as I was thinking about this, isn't this where people get in trouble relationally? Let's, let's talk about dating, right? So, um, when, when you date, sometimes it could be like fatal attraction. You know, uh, you're, you're so attracted to somebody physically. And that's normal. That's the way God wired us and made us, right? Um, but um, the physical attraction oftentimes is like 90% of the relationship. And only 10% is everything else. Well, if you go and you tie the knot, how does that work? It flips. After a while in marriage, it's 90% everything else and 10% physical. Because you grow in your love and your maturity and it's not the fatal attraction kind of thing anymore. And, but that's the mistake that people make. It's the outward. They, 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 get, they get drawn in with the outward. And they get into trouble because they realize that they need more than just the superficial. When it comes to Christian relationships, what should be done? Is the person you're dating have a heart for God? Do they put God first? Are they hungry for Him and thirsty for Him? Do they go after Him hard with their, all their heart? That's huge, folks. You know, I, I've, done, I've done weddings. Now, I always say I marry people, I don't divorce them. I've married Christians right here in this place, and they're gone. They separate. Because that wasn't lined up initially. And it's problematic. It's problematic. The scripture is saying, look behind, behind the physical, look beyond the superficial. Now, here's the other thing, too. Notice... David was a pretty good-looking guy. Handsome, ruddy in appearance. Red. In other words, he, he, he looked really, really... He was, you know, you look at him, he's like, you know, pleasant to look at. But here's the... He didn't have the stature. 
He's the youngest. And it was so deceptive because that was the, that was the one that God chose. That's the one. One other thought here that, that I want to capture, um, and I, I've always found this very, very intriguing. Um, I mentioned earlier, and the text says this, that um, Samuel moves from the oldest to the youngest, right? In other words, it's always let's start with the oldest. You constantly see this throughout Scripture. Abraham wanted Ishmael over Isaac. Joseph wanted Manasseh over Ephraim. Um, it was Jacob over um, Esau. And you could go on, and, and, and it's David over Eliab, right? Uh, and it seems to be the biblical t- cultural norm to go after the oldest, right? Because those were the customs and the expectations of the day. So I ask the question here, why? Because the oldest enjoyed certain privileges. They were typically the first, they were, fa- they were favored because they were the firstborn. They took precedence over their brothers because they were the firstborn. They got the double portion because they were of the inheritance because they were firstborn. And when dad dies, the oldest is the leader of the clan. That's, that's the expectation. Now, how often in Scripture does God always select the youngest? Almost consistently. Why is that? An Old Testament scholar had this to say, and I think he's right, as to how we understand that the older shall serve the younger. Because it's God's selection which is unmerited. You take the oldest child and he gets all, it's everything that's merited. It's everything that he's about. It's everything that he stands for. This is what should be given to him. And God just seems to flip it. Take the social expectations and the norm, all that's merited and flip it to be to the very one who it's unmerited for. I think that's the right understanding. I came across an article by a rabbi named Jeremy Kalmanofsky. And the article was entitled, The Older Shall Serve the Younger, and in commenting on the scriptures as to why God did not select the older but the younger, this is what he says. I thought it was helpful uh, to work our way through this. Uh, the, the Bible, quote, the Bible and Judaism generally are wary of thinking that natural order or strength is decisive. Beyond them is the moral and spiritual greatness that our small nation can attain by loving and serving God and God's creatures. If outward power were decisive, we and our children and our children's children would still be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Israel is driven to see past the outwardly powerful to the inwardly profound. Even in our families, Genesis reminds us, those whose birth order would seem to make them natural candidates for leadership, get this, must earn their positions through moral greatness, not good looks and big muscles. I like that. Uh, Perhaps the most stirring example of this narrative dynamic is found in the election of the Tanakhs. That's the Old Testament um, Hebrew scriptures. Uh, The election of Israel's true leading man, King David, who is anointed after Samuel has examined all seven of his older brothers. While Samuel is repeatedly impressed by the appearance of Eliab and Abinadab and Shema, And all the other sons of Jesse, God reminds the prophet to search for goodness in unexpected places. God does not see people as people see, for people see the outward appearance, but God looks through the heart. The rabbi goes on to write and conclude, quote, But God, who alone can read the heart, attitudes, and motives of a man, is not influenced by our outward facade, nor the good works we manufacture, or even the exemplary words that may flow from our lips. For the heart of every man is full of deceit. Appearances can be 
and can indeed be very deceptive. It is the one who trusts the Lord and acts upon his word that pleases the Lord. It is the man or woman who loves the Lord their God with all their heart and soul and mind and strength that satisfies the heart of the Lord. Uh, did you catch that moral greatness? Not good looks and big muscles. Goodness in unexpected places. That was King David. Someone else wrote, when God looks at a person, he cares about who they are on the inside more than how they look. It seems like our world has this, little, has this a little backward, judging people by their appearances. Amen to that. At the heart of the matter, in any matter, what counts is having a heart for God. That's translated, what do we do with the Lord Jesus Christ? What do we do with him? If you have a heart for Jesus, and you have a heart for the things of Christ, you have a heart for God. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our hearts are laid open and bare before you. Uh, you see it all. You know it all. Uh, we see very, very little, and we know very little. Uh, we cannot even plumb the depths of our own heart uh, because it's deceitful and wicked above all else. Uh, only you can know it. Uh, we can't even know the hearts of other people. Uh, we can attempt to search character and sense character, and we pray that you would give us grace and understanding in these matters. Uh, keep us from uh, outward judgments. Uh, keep us from superficial judgments. May we have grace to uh, hear your voice in matters of discernment and judgment when we need to make decisions. Uh, we thank you for the scripture. We thank you for our time this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.